All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our South Carolina Ag Disruptors program for today. Um, this is our monthly webinar on topics that could have a significant impact on South Carolina agriculture and could be a good disruptor, could be a bad disruptor, but we like to touch on a wide variety of topics and things that, again, could have a significant impact on the state's producers. And so we've had the webinar going through since April of this past year. So we've had nine webinars uh, in total. And you can find some of those past topics and speakers through our YouTube channel and our playlist there if you'd like to go back and review some of those. We have that information listed on our website as well. But this is our final installment for this year, which is our December program. And we have Dr. Steve Isaacs from University of Kentucky is going to speak a little bit on employee retention and management. And um, I saw him give a presentation on this earlier this year and this past summer. And if we think about agriculture, we could always talk about labor topics and um, seemed like any sector of agriculture can be significantly impacted by labor. So felt like it was certainly a very relevant topic for today. And uh, just a couple of quick notes. So we will continue the series next year as well. We are working on speakers and topics for next year. Um, the time for the webinar might change a little bit. So I think we're going to go back a little bit earlier and do 10 to 11, uh, but still every third Wednesday of the month. And so we'll have once a month, every third Wednesday, I believe from 10 to 11, but we will update the schedule. We'll um, put the topics and the speakers out beforehand so you can see that. We'll probably send an update through the Zoom registration as well. So as soon as we have that information on hand, uh, we'll get it out to you. And as I mentioned, you can go find our previous webinars if you'd like that information as well. And as always, if you'd like to have a certain topic or speaker that you'd like to hear about, you can let us know and we'll try to track that down as well. But um, as I mentioned for today, we've got Dr. Steve Isaacs. Appreciate him coming on for us. Uh, he's been with Kentucky for over 20 years, I believe. As 30, in fact. Okay, very good, very good. As a farm management specialist, and um, like I said, enjoyed his presentation over the summer, so asked him to join us for today, and he willingly agreed. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Steve. Okay, uh, Kevin, thanks. Uh, glad to join you folks. Uh, just uh, that is not a live Kentucky scene behind me, but Friday morning, it probably will look like that. Uh, we're forecast for some falling temperatures and maybe a bit of snow uh, uh, coming up this weekend. So uh, um, if you're traveling anywhere into the Midwest, be careful. But uh, uh, I will go ahead and go ahead and try to share my screen. Um, do this. And start the slideshow. Okay, Kevin, you're seeing my screen uh, full slideshow. Okay, good deal. Um, this is a, an incredibly broad topic, uh, and I'm going to explain a bit of the background and, and, and why. Uh, in fact, what uh, Kevin alluded to a presentation that I gave at an international farm management group in uh, uh, Copenhagen, Denmark this past summer uh, was about uh, essentially how in the land grant systems have we overlooked this topic, uh, particularly in our, our teaching thing. I don't think anybody who's out there farming and, and running the business and hiring people, they haven't overlooked it for sure. But uh, I think the problem is that is that we, we've done a really good job of teaching about animals and plants and diseases and machinery and marketing and management and budgeting and all those sorts of things and 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 really not said much in the academic world at any rate about how to manage the people and uh i, I know 40 years ago or so when i was finishing college and going out and managing a farm i realized that i could figure out how to feed cattle and grow crops and and run machinery uh, but I had to learn everything about managing people on the fly. Um, I came to Kentucky uh, uh, about 30 years ago, started teaching an ag management course. And in that course popped in uh, eh, two or three weeks of a uh, couple of weeks of stuff on. Uh, I think I started with one lecture, maybe on human resource management. Then students kept coming back and saying, well, we need more of that. So about 10 years ago, uh, I, uh, I started a, 
uh, class uh, specifically dedicated uh, to human resource management in ag. It is clearly a broad topic. I'm going to paint with a bit of a broad brush today and let you know that, that you know, it's difficult to condense 15 weeks of, of subject matter into uh, uh, one webinar, but I'm hoping that I just throw out a few points and some things that'll that'll trigger some things and 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 maybe help uh, uh, smooth things over and help make your uh, hiring, training, retention uh, work more smoothly. But it, it is uh, a broad topic. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons it didn't fit in land grant curriculum uh, it, that nobody knew where it fit. You know, it didn't go with the animals, the plants, the engineering. Uh, didn't fit real well in Ag Econ, so uh, so we started. Our course runs out of Ag Econ. It's a, a AEC 340. It's a three credit hour course, and I pull from all of the majors in the College of Agriculture, and about half of them being our equine management majors. Uh, so. Uh, and, and I told them when I went in uh, to teach this course uh, that most of what I know, I learned from my mistakes. And in fact, I start the course with a case study that it was written totally from my experience. And uh, it's an anonymous case study. It's a, a situation where a young man was hired, things went downhill. Uh, you know, I let him read the, the, the case study. Then we will do a debrief on that. And they'll talk about how pitiful that uh, uh, manager was and all the mistakes he made. And they're just very candid about it. And then at the end, I'll, I'll stand up and say, OK, and I was the manager. I was the guy who did that, and so I don't know if that destroys my credibility or builds my credibility, but uh, but clearly, uh, I think a lot of what I've learned, I, I, I've learned from somebody else, and that brings another point, which is a myth I like to dispel. Most of us have heard that experience is the best teacher. Well, I counter that. I don't think so. Experience is a good teacher, but it is not the best teacher. My reasoning for that is that experience gives us the final exam first. And if you fail it, you're out of luck. You have to start over. So while we do learn from experience, I am convinced it's not the best teacher. So if I can teach my students or you guys or anybody else uh, something that I did wrong and, and hopefully you don't do that, then I think we will have accomplished something. Uh, the format today is not going to be you know, fancy, colorful slides. I'm, I'm trying to match some of the things that I'm talking. This is almost like my speaker notes. Uh, I will make this available to uh, uh, Kevin if he wants to distribute that. And I think, Kevin, you're going to have this uh, recorded as well. Um, I will make this point. Uh, you guys can't break in with video or mics. You can communicate by chat. Uh, Kevin is going to monitor that. I have learned from trying to teach classes that I can't teach and monitor the chat room at the same time, because as soon as I glance off and try to read a chat, my train of thought just jumps the tracks. So uh, uh, so Kevin will monitor that. And if it's something he thinks uh, needs to be breaking in for clarification, well, we'll do that. Or if you have a question that we can address toward the end, I'll try to save a little bit of time uh, for that as well. Broadly, and I say broadly, this is sort of what I would like to kind of think about and talk about today, uh, all of these fairly briefly, these six things. I, I think to, to make your labor management, human resource management go well, hire carefully, onboard effectively, never stop training, make sure you're fair and equitable in evaluation, uh, pay needs to be adequate, I'll talk a little bit about that, and then uh, one of the the, the lead topics for this on retention, retain selfishly. I am convinced that we have spent far too little time thinking about retention. So I'm going to come back and, and talk about that a little bit. And that's an area that I'm trying to work in and develop some tools to help folks keep the good ones. So those are, are, are essentially the six kind of topical areas that I'm going to uh, uh, that I'm going to cover. And the first one being hiring carefully. Now. This goes without saying, anybody who's ever thought the first thing or ever heard anybody talk about uh, human resource management, they've said, you know, emphasize the importance of a job description. And I think it is important to hire to a job description, but I say this about job descriptions. They are more useful for the employer than they are the employee. If you haven't developed job descriptions, I encourage you to do this. Now, this doesn't have to be a long drawn out process, but I think that setting down, putting down on paper or on a computer screen, just some of the things to describe the job. 
And it's more than just the duties and tasks. Uh, that's it's on there. You put that. You know, what are you going to be doing? What are your responsibilities? What are the things that you're going to be doing? Uh, also, that job description should list some skills and knowledge that are expected. Uh, so, I use a lot of acronyms. I'm going to throw some at you here today. And uh, my first one is is ask. And the S and K are the uh, skills and knowledge component of a job. Um, so. Those are things you need to think about in advance. What do I need in terms of experience, of training, of abilities? Um, a lot of other effort in there, you know, who answers to who. Uh, I, I just am a big fan of job descriptions. Uh, and again, there's, they're probably more valuable to the employer than they are at the employee, but clearly uh, that, that's gonna be worthwhile. Now, we have tended, I think, I'm afraid in agriculture to have just sort of kind of taken people who didn't get a job somewhere else. And that is a problem. Uh, I think that, you know, we're much better off if we actively recruit to a good place to work. Um, I have a, a colleague up in uh, Minnesota who uses a little tagline on his uh, email that says, uh, to have good employees, be a good employer. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. We, uh, you know, people want to claim, uh, can complain about, you know, not being able to find good people or people that'll work. Uh, but uh, I think a good bit of the type of employees that we have depends on how we hire and how we train and how we, how we treat folks. Um, from that job description, I encourage folks, if you don't have an application form, uh, there are templates out there. Uh, I encourage folks to, to have something where they're getting some information down. And now this is one of those things that I learned a long, long time ago, but probably one of the mistakes I had. And I, when I was managing a farm, I had an application form that the company had and I'd give it to somebody and they'd take it out and they'd fill it out. And, you know, I got to noticing that some of them came back in and they had really nice, neat handwriting. And I knew that it was some guy who had his girlfriend or his wife fill it out. So I got to the point where I said, well, I need people that can, can read and write and communicate. So I'd say, yeah, here's the application, but sit down and fill it out. Um, there are there are good examples, good templates out there. You need to ask for the information that's legitimate to ask for. You know, their, their uh, address, all the, that sort of thing. Um, uh, educational background, uh, employment history. I think that is an important component to make sure that's on that application. And look at that employment history. And if you see gaps in that employment history, it's legitimate information that you have asked for. And if there's gaps, that means that it is, you have a legitimate right to ask about those gaps in the, the job history. It may be an employer they don't want you to know about, or it may be, you know, Lord only knows where they might've been. So, uh, so you can ask about that. So uh, uh, I encourage folks to get, take a look at that job history uh, on references, you know, check references, uh, call folks if they've given you a reference, call them, talk to them. Uh, I'm not a big, big fan of written references because you'll never see a bad one. You know, written references, you know, who in the world is going to ask for a reference from somebody that won't give them a good one? So at, at best, you're going to see maybe a mediocre uh, written reference. If I, if it's if it's kind of bland, mediocre, noncommittal, I consider that a poor reference. Uh, I'm looking in a reference for you know walks on water and preferably in all caps. So uh, uh, so think about that. But do call uh, check references. Now keep in mind some employers will only be able to say yes they worked here from these this date to this date. Uh, that may be a function of their legal department and not their reluctance to, to, to tell you something about an employee, but, uh, uh, but check those. I mean, it's just a notion of, of, of due diligence. I mean, it's the kind of things that you, you know, you can head off a lot of problems in the application and interview process. And interviews are important. Uh, in my class, uh, I set up and we do some mock interviews. Uh, we have folks go through and ask some questions. And what I mean by interview consistently is have a set of questions that you're going to ask everybody. Because if you 
get out here and start having a casual conversation with people as they come in and you're doing the interview and you talk about one set of topics with one person and something else with the next, you really can't make a good comparison. So I encourage you to have some, some good standard questions that you ask of everybody so that you can compare those, uh, those uh, responses. Now, to finish out my acronym, A is the attitude for ask. And yeah, you can look at a employment application and you can get some concept of maybe the skills, knowledge, experience that they have. But I think that where you're going to perceive something about attitude is when you're there face to face with that person and asking the kind of questions and reading body language. And yeah, we do some interviews uh, by Zoom. Uh, better than no interview at all, but I really like to be in the room with that person. And uh, in, in my background, a number of years ago, uh, I sat in the interview room essentially every Monday uh, and was part of the team that hired every extension agent in Ag, 4-H, FCS uh, here in Kentucky. So there are times we would do eight hours a day of interviews. So uh, saw a lot of people come through. Uh, uh, you know, you're, you're looking for good attitude. You're looking for people who, who want the job and, and that you think would fit in your organization. So interviews are important. Would be remiss if I rem didn't remind you that there are some things that are off limits. You know, there are topics and most of us would know what those are that, that you can't legitimately and shouldn't ask about. Um, you know, issues of ethnicity or age or uh, uh, religion or political preferences, those sorts of things. Are the, the, the good rule of thumb on whether a question is, is legitimate or not would be, does this question relate to the job? You know, if, if their ability to lift 50 pounds is part of the job, then you can say, you know, this is going to be part of the job. Is there anything that, that, that you know, would hinder you from doing that? You can't just ask somebody if they have handicaps or you can't ask somebody, you know, things, family things about uh, uh, number of kids or are you married? Um, now you can ask, you know, we expect you to be here every day. Do you have reliable transportation? Uh, you can't ask whether they own a car or where they live, but uh, the interviews are important. And my major point about this whole notion of hiring carefully is that most of your problems can be handled right here. Uh, um, in the class, I say it's a 15 week seminar, uh, uh, semester, 15 week semester, uh, I'll spend three of those weeks on essentially the stuff on this slide. Uh, we spend a lot of time on job descriptions, on recruitment, on interviewing, um, because th this is, it's important to do it right. Um, I, uh, a little bit of an illustration, uh, not related specifically to jobs, but in graduate school, I shared an office with a fellow who uh, owned some rental properties. And, and you know, we're sharing an office. I hear the end of his conversations. And uh, he would ask lots of questions when he had a, 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 a rental property that was open. and. I'm guessing that 80% of the people that uh, he talked to did not get an apartment. And we talked about that. And so, and he said, well, you know, some people just want to put somebody in there as soon as it's empty. He said, I want to get the right person in there because that's going to solve most of my problems. And hiring is very much the same way. You're going to solve a lot of problems by hiring the right person. You're sitting here thinking, yeah, that's easy for him to say. You haven't had the crops out here in the field that need to be harvested, or you hadn't had somebody walk off and quit yesterday, and I need somebody. I understand. I understand the urgency with which sometimes we need employees. Um, and almost any warm body will do sometimes. But, but I think for long-term employment, give serious consideration to the whole notion of this job description, the application, the interview, and do that thoroughly. If you do that well, then some of these other things are, are I'm not going to say they're not going to be important, but they should be a, less of a problem. We, uh, we did have a question come in, Steve. Okay. It says, uh, are there websites or forms you like to use for applications? And then a second part would be, what if people did not have internet access? Uh, both of those are, are, are good questions. Um, 
yeah, there, there are examples out there. What I would encourage you to do is take a look at similar farms that might have a website. Uh, for instance, and these folks know they wouldn't mind me saying this, there's a, a, a central, central Kentucky grain farm in operation called Homestead Farms, and they have a wonderful application. Uh, it's very thorough, got good background. So I would encourage you to look at that. There, there are just some general boilerplate kind of applications out there on the internet. Um, that you can find. And generally, they're not specific to ag, but I would encourage you to find a, a farm employer that might have that application. And, and the one that just popped into my brain was Homestead Farms. I've had uh, several of that family uh, are former students and, uh, and they do a good job. Now, without internet access, I'm always reminded, Kevin, of the uh, extension meeting. We did had somebody from uh, the Department of Agriculture in, and they were talking about going online, fill out all these forms, and about half the audience were Amish. So, you know, they didn't have that access. Um, my suggestion, if you don't have internet access, is go to an extension office and get somebody to help you. The employers, uh, some employers will have applications that can be filled out online. I Unless you're hiring a lot of people, I don't know that that's critical. You could just say, here's the application. If, if somebody has internet access, then, then uh, uh, you know, they could print it out and send it to you. Um, you know, if, if you've got a phone number, you have an application, they call you, they drop by, uh, there are, are workarounds for that. But, uh, but no, that's a good question. And don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel in terms also of job descriptions. I mean, you sit down with a blank sheet of paper and you think, well, where do I begin? Well, I encourage folks to look at somebody else's job description. Um, uh, Penn State University has, they did some good work a few years ago on uh, dairy labor and they have some good examples there. So, uh, so I encourage you to take a look at, at examples and don't feel like you have to start with a, a, a blank slate. One other quick thought on job descriptions. If, if you haven't done those and start doing those or think about modifying those, use the experience and the knowledge of current employees. Oftentimes a current employee will, will be able to describe better what the job about job is about than maybe the manager or the owner. So Kevin, hope that uh, sort of answered that question. Yeah, no, I think that's good. And, um, you know, it seemed like even maybe reference what you talked about earlier of like you even like the person to come out and fill out the application in front of you and maybe have a little bit of a conversation with them then. Yeah, uh, I'm convinced that's why if you've ever been in a fast food restaurant, a lot of times there'll be a manager setting the counter with somebody having them fill out the application right there. And I think that's that's one of those reasons. They want to see if that person is going to be able to do that and they'll take the initiative and they'll do it and they'll do it right. So, so no, I think it's a good point. Okay, we got six of these. I guess I better move on. But I don't object spending a lot of time here because this is where you can make life easier in the future if you hire the right person. Once you hire, uh, we used to call this orientation. The more recent term has been onboarding uh, and onboarding is more than that. Uh, sort of orientation to me means, you know, let's fill out the tax forms and let's get the, you know, the, uh, all the withholding papers and, you know, get the keys or get whatever you need. Those are necessary things. Onboarding is a broader process than that. Onboarding would include that, but to me, onboarding is bringing that new employee into the culture of your business. And you've got one, whether you thought about it or not. Uh, you know, you could be known as a good place to work or a poor place to work. Uh, you, your business, your farm, your family has this culture. And what you're trying to do is if you like that culture, you're trying to find employees who will fit with that. So this means more than just the, the logistics of, you know, where to park and how to get the insurance papers filled out and, and, and all those sorts of things. They have to be done. But onboarding, um, I have a colleague up at Ohio State who said onboarding starts when you start writing a job description. Think about the kind of people you want. And then it continues for a good while. It's not just that first day kind of thing. Um, in my class, I spend one week on onboarding. And I tell folks the reason I do that is because so many people do it poorly, even if they do it at all. Uh, and to emphasize that point, I will ask the students, because almost all of them have been working somewhere at this point in time, and I will ask folks to describe to me 
their first day on a job, particularly a memorable first day. And it's not difficult at all to find people who can give you just horror stories about the first day on the job. Well, I showed up and they didn't have things ready for me and I didn't know what to do. Um, yeah, I showed up and they gave me their, their procedures manual and said, here, sit here and read this. Now, is that the way to get a new employee on board? I don't think so. Um, most employees are going to be overwhelmed early on. It's important to meet those folks. Uh, I've had folks argue with me on this one. I, I've said, uh, have that employee, particularly we're going to start on Monday, have them show up an hour late uh, because that first hour, you're going to be trying to get everything else done and you don't have time to devote to that person. Uh, I've had uh, somebody argue with me and say, I want them to show up an hour early. Well, either way, you're saying that I've got time to meet you and do something with you. Um, if it's an issue, let them know where to park. You know, uh, I, I give this example. Think back. If you ever changed schools in primary or, or secondary school, went to a new school, uh, what was the worst time of day? Lunch time. You didn't know where to go, what to do. So I tell employees that, you know, first day or so on a job, meet them for lunch. Let them know where things are. This is part of the culture. Everybody else knows this, but the new employee will not. So anything that you can do to make that part go easier you know if they're if they're going to have a phone or keys or access to a vehicle have all that stuff ready and prepared for them before they get there that way they know that that you've given some thought to, to bringing them on and again the reason I spend so much time on this is that lots of folks don't do it well if, if they do it at all in fact here's uh, one point I want to make and there's research to back this up more than half of all employees decide they're going to leave within the first week. That does not mean they leave within the first week, but they will decide within the first week whether they're going to stay with you or not. Uh, and I think that's critical. So I have some folks who work in this arena and they say that they think 50% is too low a number. But there's, there's research out there with a good bit of variability. Uh, but I think this is why it is important for that new employee to get them off on the right foot, make them feel comfortable, let them know that they're welcome, that they're worthwhile. If you spend a lot of effort getting them hired, then you don't want to just bring them in and say, okay, here, go out and follow somebody and do what they do. No, give it some thought. Uh, onboard those folks correctly. Uh, try to be in that percentage that that don't decide in that first week that they're going to leave that that was just sort of a startling statistic kind of to me that that people uh, very early on uh say are willing to leave and and i asked the students and they'll say yeah they i've had a job and i knew it the first day or two that this was not going to be a permanent job i didn't i started looking for something else so so keep that in mind and i think that is my exclamation point on this whole notion of uh, of onboarding so if we hire carefully and you onboard effectively, you get people in the culture of the business and, and, and get them there, then training is going to be critical. And this kind of goes without saying, you know, the only people who have uh, employees that come pre-trained are parents. And parents think that, you know, well, they're genetically related to me. They know what to do. Well, they don't. Uh, and employees aren't either. So, so give some thought to the training, um, how they're going to be introduced to the job, what they're going to need to do. Um, keep in mind that particularly if it is a, a new task, uh, then they may be overwhelmed. Uh, I tell folks that basic training, tell them what they need to know to get through the first day. They probably don't need to know all the intricacies of the job the first day on the job. Uh, give them enough information to get them comfortable, give them some, some tasks that they can be successful with and, and get them started. That's sort of the initial training. Um, and keep this in mind as you're training folks. There's this concept called a learning curve and it's, it's almost universally misused. People will say, yeah, that has a steep learning curve. They usually mean that's a hard task to master. Well, if you were thinking of this graphically and your horizontal axis is time and the vertical axis is skill, a steep learning curve would mean you learn it fast. A hard task to learn would actually have sort of a flat learning curve, but that's not the way it gets used. But jobs will have a learning curve. And 
early on, they may grasp something, they may get discouraged. Uh, one of the things that I do is I'll, 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 I'll have students draw me the learning curve for, you know, learning to ride a bicycle or uh, your calculus class. And uh, uh, I noticed that Nathan Smith just uh, came on on board and Nathan will remember back to when he was a TA in my uh, uh, computer lab courses many, many years ago. And I had students, Nathan, draw a learning curve for uh, uh, the spreadsheets and it was like a sawtooth. And because they said that from week to week, they forgot stuff. <laughs> and so they'd go down and then go back up the next week. So Keep in mind that that different jobs are going to have different levels of difficulty and, and folks are going to have this learning curve to get up to a higher skill level. They do that differently. Not everybody learns the same. Now, in the in the literature on this, there are many arguments over how many learning styles there are. Most folks would say there's five or six or seven. You know, I'm a visual learner, I'm an oral learner. I'm a, uh, you know, I learn by doing, learn by hearing, learn by, by the same. The fact of the matter is, is that people learn differently. So you need to think about finding the way that that person learns the best. Some folks you could talk to all day and they wouldn't understand what you're saying, but if you show it to them, they'll grasp it. Uh, some folks need it written out or some folks need to hear it. Just keep in mind that people learn differently. Now, my saying on learning curves is that if someone is not learning something or learning, uh, having some difficulty, saying the same thing more slowly and more loudly is not likely to help. Uh, you know, find some way, different way of, of teaching people because we all learn differently. Uh, some of us learn by reading, by seeing, by doing. Uh, so, so give that some thought and don't just keep repeating the same old methods if it's not working. Look for some other way to try to, uh, to, try to teach somebody. Training is not just the first few days. Yes, you need to do that initial training, but training is something I think needs to go on all the time. I mean, it's it's continuous. It should not probably ever stop. Um, Kevin and I were talking earlier about some con continuing education that uh, Clemson and the UK will do for tax and in income tax preparers because they are required. A lot of professionals are required to have continuing education. Keep in mind that your employees probably need continuing education and may want that uh, because uh, when we look at, at notions of motivating employees, and that's way too much uh, material for the time that I have today. Maybe I'll come back, Kevin, next year and we can talk about uh, motivation. But uh, the the fact of the matter are that, that, that if people have difficulty learning things, then they're not likely to be as motivated. Uh, but and one of the things that does motivate people is feeling like a sense of accomplishment or that they've grasped the job. Not knowing how to do something is a is a demotivator. Uh, but developing some confidence and some skill uh, can you know lead not just to better job performance, but people feeling better about it. Um, I encourage folks, particularly in farms where we've got a lot of diversity of tasks, is to do some cross training. Make sure that you've got multiple folks that can do uh, different tasks because that that may uh, come in useful, helpful. And if folks feel like that the more they learn, the more responsibility they will have and the more opportunity they will have to move up in your organization, then I think that lets folks see the value of, of training and, and enhancing those job skills. Uh, there are very few of us who, within the first week, mastered our jobs. I think for many of us, it takes a long time to really develop some mastery in, in a task. In fact, I've always been uh, real reluctant of employees, and I've had a few of these that, you know, after the first 15 minutes, they say, oh, yeah, I've got this. I got this figured out. Well, it must have been a pretty simple task because for most of us, I think it will take a, uh, a longer period of time. And if employees can see the value of that training and see that it is good for their, you know, their developing skills and their developing opportunities in the organization, then, then I think that's certainly worthwhile. Now, I'm going to throw out another acronym. And if you want to remember these, you got to write them down. So I didn't put them on the slide. PTSD, and it doesn't mean post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome. Uh, it stands for 
prepare, tell, show, and do. Uh, this can really help if you're trying to teach somebody a new task and you can keep this in the back of your mind. Prepare. This is why we're going to do this. This is this is what we're trying to accomplish with this task. Uh, you tell them this is how you do it. You show them. You can demonstrate how to do it and then let them do it. Prepare, tell, show, do. Um, this gets at multiple learning styles. If somebody can hear it, you're telling them. If they can, if if they are visual learners, they see you do it. Uh, if they learn kinesthetically by doing things, then you've all of a sudden given at least three different ways of learning this task. Sometimes we overlook the prepare part, and they don't really understand why we're doing it. So if if pruning a peach tree is important, uh, let folks know why it's important. Tell them why you do it, show them how to do it, and let them do it. Um, so remember, PTSD is just uh, not post-traumatic stress disorder. It is prepare, tell, show, and do. And uh, I, I've realized a lot of times that, that when I've got an employee that has not done something well, I realize that I've probably left some of this out. I've just, uh, I, I didn't let them know why we were doing it, or I didn't do a good demonstration of it. So, uh, so I think that is a, another one of these uh, Isaac's acronyms that uh, I have trouble remembering things. So if I can put it in the form of an acronym, then I, I think it, it, uh, that helps me. Hire carefully, onboard effectively, train continuously, and evaluate fairly. The part of our job that we probably don't like as employers or employees is the dreaded performance evaluation. Uh, folks, before I came on this webinar, I was sitting here filling out the forms that will be used by our department chair to evaluate us in this biennium. And it's a pain in the butt. I mean, I have to put it all into this computerized system. And uh, uh, now I'm getting old enough to this, maybe about the last time I do this. But at any rate, uh, it's something I think that we have to do because either, even if we dread, even if we dread, Getting them or giving them the performance evaluation sometimes are stressful. But keep in mind that all of us want to know how we're doing. I mean, if I want to frustrate students in a college class, I don't give them any grades. I don't give them any feedback. And they hate it. They would hate it. Because we all have this notion to, to know, we'd like to know if we're doing it well or if we're not doing it well, uh, you know, what could we do to improve? So keep that in mind as an incentive for doing some performance evaluations and, and, and do those fairly. Now, it doesn't have to be as formal as the University of Kentucky does it, where we have to fill out all these uh, things on a, a computer uh, sheet and then turn it in and somebody look at these. In fact, uh, you may want to have some sort of a formal evaluation process, but it may very well be that an informal evaluation uh, it works as just as well. Uh, and a lot of larger firms are tending to move away from that formal annual or biannual performance evaluation because they they've it's, we've discovered there's not the best way probably of of giving feedback to employees so there's a lot of discussion out here about how you do this but you can give employees feedback uh you know to me i say look for opportunities to do it um I think I've got this on down here. In fact, this is the one. Uh, Ken Blanchard, uh, the one minute manager guy, he says, catch people doing the right thing. Too many managers walk around trying to catch people doing the wrong thing and correct it. If you catch people doing the right thing and reinforce it, then you're more likely to have high performance. Um, I'm old enough to have been a Dallas Cowboys football fan back in the Tom Landry area era. And uh, one of the things that Coach Landry was known for doing was that when they would look at game film, he didn't show players the plays that they messed up on. He would show them the plays that they did well and said, do this more. Uh, so I, I like Blanchard's notion of, of catching people doing the right thing and, and reinforcing that by, uh, by telling them, uh, giving them some positive feedback. 
uh, but evaluations in, in agriculture uh, at the end of a harvest season or a planting season, uh, those are good times to sit down and say, okay, how did we do? What could we do better? Uh, so uh, again, just because you don't like evaluating employees is a pretty pitiful reason for not doing it. Uh, now, employee feedback. And again, this, this line here, I spend a lot of time on it. Uh, with my students, because the feedback that we give to employees is probably going to be one of three types. Hopefully, you're giving a lot of positive feedback. Hopefully, 80, 90 percent of the time, performance is good. You're just out there giving uh, uh, attaboys or, hey, like that, or, you know, some sort of reward or incentive. So the positive feedback is the easy part. The negative is harder. And then there's one called redirective. Now, I try to help folks understand that we, we would know what negative feedback is. You did something wrong, we need to be corrected. Redirective feedback is, well, we did something wrong, but it probably wasn't your fault. The difference between redirective and negative feedback is whether it's over something that the employee had control over. And if the employee did something wrong, because of the situation or the circumstances or the lack of training and you come down on them with negative feedback they're going to do what we learned as children and it's called the fundamental theorem of attribution and we say well it's not my fault and if it wasn't the employee's fault and you come down on them with negative feedback then they're going to think that you treated them unfairly and they're going to be right it's really really important to distinguish whether or not the, the, the poor performance is because of the situation or it's because of the action of the employees. And if you're uncertain, give redirective feedback. And redirective may mean, hey, you know, we didn't do this right. This didn't turn out the way we wanted it to turn out. So let's go back and back up and see if we can address the situation. Uh, it'll improve the performance. But giving negative feedback when it's it's not the appropriate manner is really, really, um, you know, it's kind of disruptive to employees. But if they did something wrong and it has to be corrected, then, yes, it's negative feedback. And folks have to understand that, that, OK, you as the manager have to say, OK, this is not because of the situation or it's not somebody else's fault. You did this. This happened because of your action and it needs to be corrected. So, again, um, Positive, uh, negative, or redirective, uh, I think we, you give some thought to the type of feedback that you're going to give. And it's time for another acronym. As you're giving feedback, this acronym stands for specific. Don't just say, hey, good job. You know, say, good job, you know, pruning that peach tree, the example I used a minute ago. I don't know if that's a good one or not. But, you know, you catch somebody doing something right and make the, the, the feedback specific to that. Timely is the second letter, specific, timely. Don't wait until a week later. Again, if somebody's doing something well, let them know now. Or at the end of the day, we had a good day. You did that well. I like the way we did this. So make it timely, as close to the performance as possible. Um, appropriate feedback, that's the A, specific timely, appropriate. Uh, the feedback needs to be related to what they're doing. And then finally, genuine. Specific, timely, appropriate, and genuine. If the feedback is not genuine, people are going to understand that and they're going to think you're patronizing and they're going to be right. So don't give false feedback. When it's timely, when it's appropriate, give specific feedback and make it genuine. So uh, specific, Timely, appropriate, and genuine. Yet another one of my acronyms to help me re remember things. Uh, so we've been through uh, hiring, onboarding, training, uh, evaluating. Uh, a couple of things here I want to hit as we begin to wrap up. Uh, pay adequately. And I'm running out of time. I'll, I'll move along with this. Pay is important. Uh, but I want to make a point here. And I've had lots of arguments, particularly students over this, that... Uh, Pay is not a motivator. My students will say, oh, it is too. You pay me and I'll work hard. Well, 
as far back as the mid 1960s, when this fellow named Herzberg did a lot of work on motivation, he found out that that, that essentially that pay was not a motivator, or if it was, it was a very short run motivator. In fact, there's some research to suggest that the motivational impact of a pay raise lasts 1.5 pay periods. And the Herzberg guy that I mentioned said that the primary motivational impact of a pay raise is the anticipation of the next one, not the one that you got last month or last year. Now, he went on to say that if pay is not a motivator, it can darn sure be a demotivator. Uh, in fact, Herzberg called it something called hygiene factor. I'm not sure why I used that term, but it's something that, that's necessary. It has to be there. It's necessary, but in and of itself, it cannot be the primary motivator. So if you're at the situation where you think, well, I pay them well and they better work hard. Well, think about what motivates folks. And they may initially take a job because the pay is better, but will they stay there if all the other conditions are, are wrong? So my main point here on pay is, is don't view it as a motivator. View it as the compensation uh, you're exchanging pay for their services or for their work. Now, that being said, generally not everybody in, this, in business is going to make the same amount. So you've got to use skill level, experience, uh, time on the job, the nature of the job itself to determine pay scales. And in my class, I have students develop a, a pay ladder uh, for different skills or, or for different things as, as they go through it. Um, so this is a point I make firmly as well. Don't miss a payday ever. Don't ever miss a payday. And usually this is, I ran into this where small firms that were just cash flow and said, well, I'll you know, pay you first of the week. No, don't ever miss a payday. An organization as, as big as the University of Kentucky about, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, missed a payday. They changed banks and something in the computer system got mixed up and all of the biweekly employees pay did not go in on the day it was supposed to. This made the local news for days because here you are, you know, 6,000 employees that didn't get their check deposited. So they start bouncing utility payments and rent payments and everything else. And it was a royal mess. If you want to foul things up in a job uh, situation or employment situation, miss a payday. So don't do that ever. And I mentioned this a minute ago that pay is, may not be a motivator, but it darn sure is a demotivator. Uh, if people think they're not paid fairly, they're not compensated appropriately, then that can be a, a demotivating factor. So hiring, onboarding, training, evaluation, pay. How do we keep employees? We get good ones, we treat them well, we train them, we pay them adequately. How do we keep them? Well, it's probably out of necessity, but I'm convinced that that sometimes we spend too much too much energy on the problem children and not enough energy on the winners. Because it's easy if you've got an employee that's doing well, you don't have to spend much energy there. You know, you're out here trying to get somebody to show up on time, or you're trying to get somebody to keep from breaking things, or you're trying to, you're, you're working on situations where you're trying to remedy a poor situation and you don't have time to go out here and work with the winners. Well, that's why they leave. And good employees are always going to have good opportunities somewhere else. So this is an area that uh, Kevin and I've talked about this. I've been spending some more time thinking about how do we help people retain employees? And there's something that I'm, I'm working on uh, uh, now is to try to develop some sort of a form or some questions or a template to do a stay interview. I talked earlier about that hiring interview well, a stay interview can actually kind of take the place of a performance evaluation, because if you've got a really good employee, you know, the performance evaluation is really easy. I like what you're doing. Keep doing it. So if that employee is, is worth keeping, find out what it takes to keep them. Sit down and do a stay interview. Uh, you know, it's easy to overlook the good employees because they're off out here doing their job, uh, but these folks need praise and credit as well. And I will make this point. Credit and praise are probably the least expensive and most valuable fringe benefit that you can offer to employees. Uh, doesn't cost you anything to give that 
that specific, timely, appropriate, and genuine feedback and, and do that and make sure you don't overlook those good people. As you, those are the ones that you want to keep. You don't want to have to start over with this. So, so pay them well for sure, uh, but they're probably not working for you because of your pay. They're probably working for you because they like the job they like you and and you make sure that that they're there um ask them okay what does it take to keep you happy and productive what could i do to make your job better i really like what you're doing but but if you could improve or change one thing about your job what would it be and listen and if it's possible then then try to do that uh, Keeping good employees and having low turnover is, is, I mean, I think it's a real key to success because you're not spending all your time hiring or onboarding or training. You've got the good people there, you've got them in place and they're high performance, high productive employees. Be a good place to work. Be the kind of place that people want to work. If that's the case, then word's gonna get around. And, and I say in terms of recruiting, some of your best recruiting efforts are the employees that you have. Because they're going to tell folks that, hey, yeah, this is a good place to work. They treat you well. They 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 acknowledge you when you do when you're doing a good job. And I like working there. That's one of the best testaments that I think folks can have. And I'll wrap this section up with uh, an illustration. Unless you've been in the northeastern U.S., you may not know about Wegmans grocery stores. Uh, Wegmans is a supermarket chain uh, based in Canandaigua, New York. They're mostly in New England and down the Atlantic coast somewhere, but some of you uh, may have uh, been in the Wegmans sometime. If you ever travel in that part of the world, go to one. It is a very unusual supermarket. They are generally overstaffed. They've got lots of, op of offerings. They, uh, there are tons of stuff on the shelf. Everybody's cross-trained. And Wegmans will consistently make the Forbes list of best places to work in the U.S. They've been at the top a few times. They're almost always in the top 10 or 15. We took our ag leadership class to New York several years ago, and we went to uh, Wegmans headquarters. And they talked to us about the, the business and the history and what they did. And then they did something that I thought was, was really remarkable for an employer. They did not take us on a tour of the facility. They told us to go out on the floor, stop any employee, and ask them any question we wanted to. Now, that is a mark of, of confidence in your employees. So being the nerd that I am, I take my clipboard and I start asking folks the, the basic question. Why do you like working at Wegmans? I probably interviewed 12 or 15 people. They gave me a lot of different answers. Interestingly enough, not a single one of them said it was because of the pay. They all said it had to do with the nature of the job and the way they were treated and their coworkers and, and a number of other things. So I think it really is important. If you want good employees, be a good employer. So I've covered a broad brush here on hiring, onboarding, training, evaluating, uh, paying, and retaining. Wrap this up. This is not rocket science. It's not rocket science. It's harder. Rocket science is easy compared to managing people. And I have a quote that I use from a rocket scientist who said that, you know, I tell students to be in the class, there's no formulas for this. So they're, they're all gung-ho. Yeah, it's not calculus or statistics or econometrics. You know, there's no formulas. I want to say when you get out and manage people, you'll wish there were. You wish that you could use some sort of formula and it worked every time. It won't because people are unique. They think, they hear, they listen, they respond, they talk back, they feel, they have these emotions that tractors and trees and plants and animals, well, maybe animals have emotions, but, but at any rate, people are unique. They're different. They're not like anything else that we manage, and I think that's what makes it so difficult to do in, in the job place. Doing this is hard work. To me, this is one of the hardest things in running any business is managing the people and the human component of it. But just because it's hard work, you're not ever going to get it completely right. You're going to do the same thing twice and three times and the fourth time. It won't work. So it, it's never going to be the same. But don't stop trying. This is something that, again, I think you have continuous education with. Um, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. I think uh, we got just a few minutes. Uh, if you have a question, if there's anything in the chat room, uh, I haven't looked, but Kevin, what have we got? 
Yeah, thanks a bunch, Steve. Uh, that was that was very good. It reminds me of uh, a little bit of what someone said when I first started in the working world, which was people will be the best part of your job and they will be the worst part of your job. And I think that's, Absolutely. that's pretty much true. Yep. Um, we did have a question. Someone was just wanting j just a brief rundown of the like six points that you mentioned earlier about like hire carefully, um, pay adequately. I think they just wanted to see that just a little bit more. Yeah, let me, uh, I thought there was a dip. Yeah, I'll back up there. Yeah, there we are. And again, uh, you know, this is unfortunately compressing 15 weeks of an HR course into uh, uh, into an hour. So I have just obviously hit the high points. But the fact that you have this seminar, that you're here, you're listening to this, suggests that you're interested in this. And, uh, and hopefully somewhere along the line, I've given some idea or some thought or some notion that will, that will, that will help as you work with managing what arguably is the hardest part of any business. Yeah. And, 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 uh, this was a little bit different than the talk that I heard back in the summer, but it was basically right along the lines of what I thought would be helpful. And it's, I think it's been very good. We have, a couple other questions. Um, okay. Any thoughts on pay as it relates to giving employees bonuses or an equity share in the business? Can this model be successful? Yeah. Uh, and again, when, when I do the sessions on pay, these are the kind of things we talk about. Uh, incentive based pays, uh, you know, they're performance related. If you use those, make absolutely sure that if the pay is related to performance, that my golden rule is, is it the, that it needs to be something that is within the control of the employee. That's what makes on a lot of farms things like profit sharing difficult because the profit may be more determined by the weather and the markets than it does to what the employee is doing. Find something that the employee's performance will enhance and reward that. Now, they also mentioned bonus in there. If you give bonuses, particularly like seasonal bonuses or holiday bonuses or something like that, consider those part of the base pay. If you start giving bonuses, you can't stop. I mean, they're just part of the base pay. Uh, I had an employee quit one time because uh, the folks I was managing the farm for, they determined the bonuses, not me. And they'd had a really good year and they gave good bonuses. The next year, it had been a poor year. They cut back on the bonus and that employee didn't come back after Christmas uh, because he thought his, he was getting, his pay was going the wrong way. Well, when I looked, he had made about 25% more that year than he had the year before. But when the bonus went down, he got mad and quit. So if you if you use bonuses, there's nothing wrong with them, you know, as a reward, uh, but just count on figuring them in as part of the base pay and on the incentives, just be careful, make sure that that's something that's within the control of the employee uh, that's going to be the reward. Okay. Was there another question, Kevin? Um, I think that's it for the questions. There were just a couple of comments that they enjoyed the, the talk and enjoyed the different quotes um about being being a good place to work and things like that so um they seem to enjoy it um, good good uh well I, I'll, I'll say this thanks for your participation it's uh we had two years practicing sitting here in my office and staring at that little dot at the top of a computer screen <laughs> and and so uh this is uh this is difficult but i'm glad you uh, were able to tune in today and uh and kevin maybe someday i'll come to south carolina and do it face to face <laughs> Well, um, yeah, that, that sounds good. And again, thanks very much. Um, and perhaps, yeah, in the future, we can do a, a deep dive on a little bit more um, specifics into some of these areas and things. So we'll, we'll kind of keep that in mind. Um, there was the question of, is the Ag Leadership Program only in Kentucky? Um, I, I think there are some Ag Leadership Programs here. Um, I would have to do a little bit more follow up on that. Um, to find out, but yeah. uh, yes, you do have, uh, uh, South Carolina does have an ag leadership, uh, program. Um, uh, Kirby player, uh, is the coordinator right. of that program. Yeah. Is that right, Nathan? Yeah. Palmetto yeah. ag leadership is, mm -hmm. uh, directed by Kirby player. Mm -hmm. The one you're referring to that you do is, is Kentucky, right? Right. Right. Yeah. It's Kentucky ag leadership. Uh, Kirby just started that. Per I think maybe he's in his second cohort. Nathan, is that right? I think he's gotten through his first class. Yeah, <clears throat> he, he is second cohort. Um, COVID slowed down the 
the first one. But, um, yeah, it slowed <laughs> down a lot of stuff. But yeah, that's that's a good question. And I am a big proponent of, of ag leadership development program. So if you have an opportunity to do that, I've worked with Kirby some. Uh, he's part of a, a uh, group that we have of, of folks who direct those programs around the country, and there's probably about 30 or 35 state uh, programs like that. So, uh, yeah, uh, South Carolina is fairly new, but uh, yeah, if you have an opportunity, take take a look at that. All right. Uh, well, thanks again, Steve. And uh, as we mentioned, we will have a recording of this webinar. We'll share that out. Um, on our social media in a couple different places. And I think Steve mentioned he'll share the slide presentation as well. So if you'd like that information, we can certainly get it to you as well. But uh, but thanks again, Steve. Well, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. And folks, have a good holiday season. All right. Thank you.